Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again. Uh, thank you for joining us again to Dental Chat by Aluro. Uh, we've been doing this, you know, from last year lockdown and now doing this lockdown, and hopefully we keep, you know, adding value to your practice, bringing some business topics and some clinical as well. Uh, last week we had uh, Dr. Miles from just across the ditch talking about the facial aesthetics in the dental arena, and you know how can that add value to your practice. Um, and today we have uh, Dr. Lavin from not across the ditch, but across the Pacific in, um, in Los Angeles. And uh, Doc, uh, Lorne um, has a, over 30 years involved in dentistry and he's a dentist. I think he's still a dentist um, or, or he was a dentist maybe, but now he actually helps dentists to protect themselves from uh, the whole cybersecurity, which 20 years ago when he started the business as a founder of a digital dentist, uh, maybe it wasn't that, you know, as a topic and they're in everybody's minds, but these days with all how social media, from social media to any online bookings and everything is online, you records so they can create a, is a huge race, right? So, um, so uh, thank you for joining us from the uh, LA, uh, Lorne, uh, and I will leave it to you, yeah. Thanks. I'll uh, put my screen up now and hopefully everyone can see it. Can you see it okay? Can everyone see the screen okay? I'm not hear anything. So I, I assume you can. So we'll, we'll let us know if, if it's not the case. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, definitely a, a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, just to sort of give you a little bit about my background, uh, I was a practicing periodontist. I, I practiced for 10 years. Uh, I didn't love doing perio, to be perfectly honest with, with you. So what I do is to work with offices all across the world. Most of our clients are obviously in North America. We do have some clients in Australia, the UK, uh, Brazil. Um, cybersecurity and especially ransomware has become such a huge topic over the last number of years that it's really critical that uh, you know what you need to know and take the steps to, to get yourself as compliant as you, as you can possibly be. So as I mentioned, you know, I did do periodontics and implant dentistry for 10 years. Along the way, I picked up a number of computer certifications, uh, network certifications, uh, honestly, I, I thought my clients would, would be important to them, but nobody seems to care. They don't know what the certifications are, what they do. So, uh, you know, basically, I do IT. I was very fortunate that I grew up in Canada. My family owned a large electronics business, and I grew up in technology. This is long before you, you had even like the major appliances out there. This is in the, the late 60s and early 70s. So, um, my family's business was all capacitors and resistors and transistors. And I think my uh, my grandfather brought Panasonic into Canada. We were the first people to, to work with them. So uh, this, that's been my background. It's always been my true love and passion. So I get to combine my passions of dentistry and IT by working exclusively with, with dental offices. So the format for today is we've already done the introduction. The, the way that I structured the webinar uh, for this afternoon is an FAQ, frequently asked questions. What are the questions that I see on a given day from, from our clients you know, a given week? I do have a special offers to make to people, and then uh, we'll open it up for Q&A. I also had, had mentioned that if you have some questions during, I have no problem being interrupted. So you know, if you have a question, I can't see the questions on my screen, but they'll interrupt me if, if there's a question that comes up and I'm, I'm more than happy to stop and answer questions during the, the presentation and certainly at the end as well. So what are those frequently asked questions? What are the questions that we get from dental offices on a regular basis? Uh, first off, you know, if we talk about cybersecurity, what exactly does that mean? You know, what are the, the terms involved with that? Uh, secondarily, you know, we've all, uh, hopefully you've all heard about ransomware. What is that? Why is it so critical uh, that you understand it? And what do you need to do to deal with it? Uh, you know, here in the U.S., we have HIPAA. In, uh, in Canada, they have PIPIDA. 
I am certainly not passing myself off as an expert on the Privacy Act of 2020 in, in New Zealand. I certainly did enough reading to have, that I have a good understanding that a lot of the concepts are very similar to what we have here in the U.S. You know, the basic concept is always the same, which is that as practitioners, we are given access to private patient information, their name, their date of birth, their credit card information. Uh, you know, we have social security numbers here. I'm sure you have something similar in New Zealand. Um, we have an obligation to keep that information private and secure. And that's basically what I assume the Privacy Act does. That's basically what HIPAA does as well. But what role does this play with this? We'll talk about that. How do you protect your data? You know, to me, even though I know dentists are spending oftentimes, you know, $100,000 plus on cone beam system and digital, you know, uh, CAD cam systems. Uh, to me, there's no greater asset though than your data. So what are you doing in order to keep that uh, information protected? Let's, let's talk about firewalls. We'll talk about those a little bit. What does a firewall do? Why do you need one? Six, uh, we're gonna talk about something that was kind of near and dear to my heart, which is called application whitelisting or ring fencing. This is the newest way of dealing with malware, ransomware, uh, computer viruses. Uh, I have not seen anything in the 20 plus years that I've been doing IT that is as effective as this whitelisting, application whitelisting and, and ring fences. We'll talk about what that is and, and what the systems are that are, that are available. Uh, what about keeping your systems up to date? Uh, you know, do we need to patch them? And how do you go about doing that? You know, software, every software program out there, Windows and Office and Adobe and every program out there has security holes. And the companies are constantly releasing patches. A lot of times, unfortunately, the patches have holes in them as well. So you're, you're playing this, this nonstop game of whack-a-mole to try to snuff out all those, those, uh, those, all those security risks. But how do you do that? How do you keep everything current and, and up to date? How about back at the data? You know, when you're as a dentist, you know, a patient can go to a dentist and get, you know, you go to 10 dentists, you're going to get 10 different treatment plans. Same thing when it comes to backing up your data, that you can talk to 10 different IT companies. They'll give you 10 different answers about the best way to back up your data. I will certainly let you know what I think is the best way to do it and why that's the case. Uh, do you have to encrypt the data? And if so, how do you do that? I, you know, the answer is yes, I do think you should be encrypting your data. Uh, but we'll talk about the, how easy it is to do that. Uh, and finally, we'll talk about risk assessments. You know, do you have to do one and how do you do one? Uh, obviously, every country is unique about the, the certain regulations that they have about how you do one. But, you know, it's like no different than treating patients. You know, when a new patient walks into your practice, you don't just start treating them. I mean, I, I hope you don't. Uh, you, you typically, you're taking a series of, of x-rays, you're doing your periodontal probing, your restorative charting, doing intraoral, extraoral exams. And based on all of that, you put together a treatment plan and you go ahead and treat the patient. This is pretty much the same way. You don't know unless you actually look to see what the problems are. So we'll talk about how you can go about doing that. Why is this important? You know, we hear about it on the news, but why do I think it's so important for dental offices to be aware of this? Uh, the news is just, it's almost impossible to go to a website at any given day and not hear about the latest breach. Uh, this was from a software company called Kaseya. It was all over the news uh, back in July. The, um, the real challenge with this is that Kaseya is software used by IT companies to remotely manage their clients. We don't use Kaseya. We use something very similar to that called ConnectWise, but it's the same concept. You know, we have over 1,500 computers that we manage and monitor in a portal. If someone managed to get into that portal, they don't have access just to our computers. They have access to every one of our clients. So you, you get this exponential uh, growth of the ransomware because it's not just attacking one site, that ransomware cannot be pushed out to thousands of sites uh, simultaneously. Uh, there was this all over the news here in the US as well, uh, back in June, a colonial pipeline, uh, it was a, a main uh, source of gasoline for uh, the East Coast of the United States. Uh, there were all kinds of lines at the pumps for, for a number of weeks, but you can see, and I, I highlighted it here, it was the result of a single compromised password. That's all it takes. Once someone gets into your system, they're in. 
whether that compromised password was something that was just not a secure password, whether that person you know, lost it and it was, it was found by somebody, whether you know, it was a little more nefarious that they sold it to, to these hackers, who knows? But um, that's all it took you know, for it's just one password being given away. And now you have uh, people that are in your system that you don't really want there. But you may be thinking, well, you know, what about dental offices? I mean, they're not a big target, right? We're, we're solo practitioners. Well, that's not the case at all. Uh, there was this a couple of years ago, there were 400 offices in Wisconsin that were all hit simultaneously. Uh, there was another hundred or so in Colorado that were, were hit. And it's all because, as I said, of this control panel, this portal. Uh, and this is one thing that we'll be discussing this evening is how do you, or what are the questions to be asking your IT provider? Because for example, the way that these portals are supposed to work is that you use what's called two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. It's not enough to have a username and a password to log onto some of these sites. When you log in, it should send a code, a unique code to your cell phone or to your email that you have to enter that code in order to access the site. Those offices, those ones in Wisconsin, the ones in uh, Colorado, their IT providers were not using any type of two-factor authentication. So once someone was able to get in there, they now had access and they could push out that ransomware to the, those hundreds of offices simultaneously. Very devastating, as you can imagine. Ransomware is a significant portion of all the cyber insurance claims. This is just from last year. This is the recent, most recent data that we have is from first half of 2020. Um, but 41% of all cyber insurance claims uh, were from ransomware. I apologize that this slide's a little bit hard to read. Uh, I couldn't blow it up without it getting too grainy. But the, the key takeaways from this is that a good third, 34% of all healthcare organizations, and that includes dental practices, were hit by ransomware in the last year. Uh, a third of those also said that they paid the ransom to get their data back, which is what keeps those people in business. They, they see these statistics as well, and they know, you know, you know there's a, they have a one in three chance that they're gonna get the, the ransom. Uh, but the key takeaway for me is the line below that, which says only 69% of the encrypted data was restored. Basically, you, even if you pay the ransom, even if you get the unlock key, which there's no guarantee that's going to happen, there's still about a third of your data that you're not going to be able to unencrypt. And you know, if that's some Word documents or spreadsheets, maybe it's not the end of the world, but if it's your practice management software, the, 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 dat, the dot .dat file, um, that's, that's terrible. You're not going to be able to recover from that. So um, these can be pretty devastating. So, you know, the pearls of wisdom that I hope that you, you get, and these are all like more general terms when it comes to talking about these uh, systems, is that when we're talking about cybersecurity, uh, compliance with the Privacy Act, there's no right, wrong, or best way of doing it. Every practice is unique. You have to figure out what's the right way for your practice or best for your practice. But, you know, there's a difference between a, a small solo practitioner. You know, here in the U.S., we have DSOs. I'm not sure if you have that in New Zealand, but... You know, DSOs would have you know, 50, 100, 150 locations that they're managing all at the same time. And what they have to do is different than what a solo practitioner would have to do. Don't put the cart before the horse. In other words, we'll talk about some of the systems that you need to do, but oftentimes people are, for example, they're, they're spending a lot of time, money, and, and energy on looking at firewalls, looking at anti-ransomware software, the application whitelisting that we're gonna talk about, but they haven't looked at their computers, which are still running Windows 7, which hasn't been patched in close to two years, they're still running server 2008, you know, that they have these unpatched, unsupported operating systems that they need to address. Finally, you know, the most important things, you know, they, in real estate they say are location, location, location. For me, when it comes to, to IT, cybersecurity, it's planning, planning, planning. There's absolutely nothing wrong with doing things in stages as long as you have some type of game plan or treatment plan of how you're going to resolve that. Uh, and we're going to talk about what that is uh, for the rest of the, the afternoon. So what is cybersecurity? Now, there's tons of definitions out there. It's basically all the technologies, processes, and practices that protect 
anything technology related, networks, devices, programs, data, from attack, from unauthorized access. Some people use the term information technology, security, but it all means the, the same thing. For dental offices, typically we're talking about a number of different things if we're talking about cybersecurity. Uh, first is a firewall, second is encryption, third, and we'll get into all these in a little more detail, patching, uh, anti-ransomware software, uh, antivirus software, application whitelisting, backup and disaster recovery, staff training, and regular risk assessment. These are would all fall under the cybersecurity definition. It would also fall under the Privacy Act definition in a lot of cases. What about ransomware? I mean, we've heard the term, but does everyone know exactly what I'm talking about? It's a specific type of malware or virus that attacks systems by locking the screen or, or the files. The, the far and away, the most common one is locking the files until you pay the ransom. They're also called crypto ransomware. Uh, what's really gotten nasty over the last few years is we're seeing uh, double and, and, and triple, in, um, what's the word I'm thinking of, uh, not uh, encryption, but it's, it's really bad. So what they're doing is that they're saying, hey, if you don't pay the ransom, because a lot of times you, if you have a good backup, you may not need to do it, um, you'll say, well, I'm not going to pay the ransom. Then they'll say, fine, you're not going to pay the ransom. We're going to put all your patient files uh, online, which is not a good thing. <laughs> and it's happened to a lot of businesses. Um, and then if you still, this, uh, that's still not enough motivation for you to say, okay, I'm going to pay this. Uh, they, in a lot of cases, they have access to those patient files. They can start calling up the patients and let them know that their information was, was hacked and, uh, you know, you really want to avoid something like that. So it, it's a pretty, like I said, it's, it's pretty nasty stuff. This is what, you know, I got this from one of our clients who was hacked before, uh, before we started working with them. But this is typically the type of thing that you would get is that you come in in the morning and you can't run your program because everything's locked. And you have this, uh, this pop-up on the screen that tells you what you need to do. And it typically involves having to, to go to a website using a very specific type of browser called the Tor browser, which is a, a secure browser. There's no way of, of tracing any activity on that. And then of course, they'll give you the instructions of how to pay. And it has to be in some type of cryptocurrency. They obviously do not take checks or Visa or American Express or anything like that. It's uh, for the most part, non-traceable. Although with uh, that previous case I told you about with uh, the pipeline, Colonial Pipeline, they were able to actually recover some of that. Uh, but we were, you know, they paid, I think, something like $8 million. Uh, it's going to be a lot different when you're paying forty or $50,000. What are the, the consequences of, of getting hit with ransomware? First off, you're going to be down because there's a number of things that have to happen. First off, we have to get rid of the ransomware. We don't know exactly where it entered. We have to shut off that, whatever that port of entry was. More often than not, it's through email. Someone opened up a link that they shouldn't have. Sometimes it could be someone that went to a website uh, that was a sketchy website. Um, the, that's the most common way. The second most common is an unpatched operating system. You have you know, basically what they call brute force attacks where they just try to find an open port on your router or just try to get in some way and they keep hammering away until they, they find that opening. So um, for the most part, it takes about a week or so in order for you to recover completely. You know, we can usually get someone up and running within a day or two. It depends if we have a um, depends if we have a backup that we can restore from. And the typical cost of the ransomware incident, their downtime, not being able to practice, uh, fines, penalties, all that stuff, is about sixty-four thousand. That's U.S. dollars, so that's around what about ninety thousand or so. I think it's like seventy cents on per per uh, for New Zealand dollars. So uh, it's it's a lot. It, it's something that you want to try to avoid happening. Like I said, it's just happening every single day. You see it with um, this is a recent one of Accenture, which happened a couple of months ago. It's it's happening across the board. This is what one of those websites looks like where a company refused to pay the ransom. And you can see they have all their 
their clients listed here. And it's interesting on the left, you see uh, new clients. Well, these aren't clients. <laughs> these are people who decided they didn't want to pay and uh, they, they definitely paid in other ways that uh, their information is online. So you really don't want this to be uh, you, in, in my opinion. So does this have anything to do with the Privacy Act? Now, like I said, I'm not claiming to be an expert on the Privacy Act. I, I am pretty much a HIPAA expert. Uh, I read for a couple of hours about the Privacy Act uh, earlier in the week. So I think I know a little bit about it, but uh, does it have anything to do with it? Well, here's a question to ask you. you know, if you're hit with a ransomware virus, do you have to report a breach? Is that statement true or false? And the answer, at least according to the Privacy Act is true, that you have to report to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner if you get hit with a ransomware virus. So even though we, we don't think of breaches in those terms, think of a breach is normally thought of as, well, someone hacked into my network or uh, I lost my laptop or you know, something along those lines. But really it's all about loss of control of your data, which is exactly what a ransomware does. It locks the files. So. Um, if you're hit with ransomware, you have suffered a breach and have to report it as such. So the approach that I take when it comes to helping offices to get more cyber secure is basically a, a six step plan. First and foremost, we get, foremost, we have to keep the bad guys out, keep them from getting onto your network in the first place. You know, that's, we'll talk about how to do that. That being the case, even though we want to keep them out, you can't keep everything out. Uh, so you're going to have to deal with it if it does get in. How do we deal with the viruses that, that manage to get through? What about encryption? You know, how, what does that do for us and, and how does that going to help us in this process? How do we back up and how do we have some type of disaster recovery in place uh, for our systems? What about insurance? Now, again, I don't know New Zealand laws. Here in the States, it's very easy to get cyber liability breach insurance. I assume you, know, you have similar access down there, but again, I'm not, I'm not an expert. And finally, some type of risk assessment. So how do you keep the bad guys out? Firewalls and, and patching are, are the two methods that I think are the easiest and best ways of doing that. So what's a firewall? We've heard that term a lot. It's basically a network security device. It monitors all the traffic that comes into your practice, ingoing and outgoing, and it decides whether to allow that traffic based on a set of security rules that you or, or the manufacturer has set up. These things have been around for, for a couple of decades now. They've been around for a long time. Um, there's all different types of firewalls. The one that I would always recommend that I'm talking about is a hardware firewall, an actual separate device. Now there are uh, like basically every router out there, you know, a router is a device that allows you to share your internet connection throughout the other computers in your home and your office. Every router out there has a built-in firewall and they're okay. Uh, it's one of those things where you tend to get what you pay for, the better the firewall, the better it does a job of, of keeping the bad guys out. So the first thing you should do is set up and properly uh, configure a business class firewall. Uh, the home use routers, the Linksys, the D-Links, the Netgears, I tend to stay away from them. I think you know, they're just not the best. There are better options. I happen to like the Sophos models, there's Sonicwall, there's Ubiquity, I mean, there's a bunch of ones out there. But you know, for the most part, no matter where you live, there are security regulations that say you need to have a firewall in place to monitor the network traffic. Uh, again, here in the US, and I, as I said, I'm pretty sure it's true for the Privacy Act as well. If you uh, are hit with ransomware, if you suffered a breach, you have to record, re report that breach to the, the authorities. How do you know if your firewall is working? Well, an easy way to do that is get an IT company, an outside farm, firm to do some testing. We call it penetration testing. And there's other terms for it, but basically we know your IP address and we see, can we get through that firewall? Can we get through, you know, through the, the security that you have in place? That's really the best way to find out if, if what you're doing is, is actually working. As I said, I happen to like the Sophos ones out there. There's a, a plenty of other ones out there. Most of the, the better business class firewalls will run you probably somewhere in the eight to 900 New Zealand dollar range, give or take, you know, there's some, you can get four or $5,000 Cisco enterprise level firewalls. You don't really need that. I think for a dental office, 
you do need something that can do traffic or web filtering, stateful packet inspection. There's a lot of different features that, that you look for in, in the firewall. What about uh, the patching? That's the second thing that I mentioned, keeping the bad guys out. You know, Does the Privacy Act require that you patch all your software on a regular basis? And sure enough, just like it is here with, with HIPAA, that's true. You need to be, keep your, your software current and up to date as, as well. So make sure you are updating your system with critical security patches when they become available. Uh, oftentimes hackers can get in if, they, if you don't have the latest patches. Uh, it's not a long time from the time that, that people find a vulnerability to the people who are exploiting it, usually within a couple of weeks. So if you don't have the latest updates, uh, you're potentially gonna be at, at a very high risk. As I said, this, there is part of the law that you have to have some type of patch management in, in place. So you've got a good firewall, you're patching everything, but you know that's not going to protect you against all potential malware. A uh, staff member could click on a, an email link. Uh, you know you could have a USB thumb drive that you connect that you didn't realize had malware on it. You know that all of that bypasses the the firewall and the patching. So you have to deal with the stuff that gets in. Make sure you have antivirus and, and spyware protection and keep it current and up to date. Uh, the ones we don't tend to recommend the free ones, you know, windows comes with a free program called defender, which is mediocre at best. Uh, if it's free, yeah, again, you, you tend to get what you pay for. So, uh, I happen to like uh, one by ESET called nod 32. There's trend micro, there's Kaspersky. There, there's a number of good programs out there. Make sure you clean off spyware as well as, as antivirus software. These programs are typically updated at least once a day. You know, they're, off, they're often coming up with new virus definitions as new viruses are being seen and uh, they're upgrading them in a, in a pretty quick manner. For antivirus, like I said, I tend to stay away from the free ones like Avira and Avast. Uh, ESET is the one that we recommend for most of our clients. I never really loved Norton. It, it tends to be a real resource hog, meaning that it really tends to slow down systems a lot. But uh, if it works for you, great. Uh, you know, whatever works, that, that's the end of the day. Even though every antivirus software vendor will tell you that they do a good job against the ransomware viruses, in my experience, that's really not the case. So I highly recommend that you get, supplement it with uh, some anti-ransomware software like Intercept X, Hitman Pro, you know, those are, they're all owned by the same company. All this is owned by Sophos. So it really does, they all kind of do, does the same thing. But um, we, we highly recommend that you supplement it with that. The thing that has really changed it for us as an IT provider is something called application whitelisting. And there's a similar term called uh, ring fencing. What is application whitelisting? What it is, it's the practice of, what we basically do is we index your computer and we create a list of all the approved software applications that are permitted on that system. After a certain period of time, usually a week or two, we flip a switch and then it goes into deny all mode, which basically says that from that point forward, if you try to run a program, and all viruses are programs. They're just tiny little programs with a series of instructions to tell them what to do. Uh, if a program tries to run and it's not on that list, it gets stopped in its tracks. It literally can't run. We've been, uh, been uh, recommending and installing these software systems for about eight months now for our clients. We have not seen a single virus infection on any of our 350 clients since we started installing the software. And that's not something I could have said before that. So um, very, very effective. It's, it's, it's a fancy way of, of, of dealing with things, but um, it's something that we think is really great. What about ring fencing? It's very similar. Ring fencing builds fences around applications to find how they integrate with other software. So for example, uh, let's say you're using Dentrix. Dentrix, you can determine or Dentrix will determine which software programs are allowed to access it. Here in the States, we have third-party programs that will access Dentrix for things like patient reminders and uh, appointments. So programs like uh, Solution Reach and Yappy and Demand Force, uh, you know, all those types of programs. 
So ring fencing is basically the way of those software programs controlling which applications can act, act, access their database, which again, you want to stop the ransomware viruses from being able to do that because that's the ones that they want to hit is, the, uh, is those uh, database files. So this slide, I think this kind of explains, it's just an infographic that explains the process. We scan the system, that process takes a, a week or two for us to really get a list. We actually compare that with our global database of all of our clients. So we, you know, we have for hundreds and uh, hundreds of offices, a list of all the programs that are approved software programs. It builds this white list of, uh, the, of the, the programs that uh, are allowed to run. Anything that tries to run will be blocked until we release it uh, from being blocked. And of course for ransomware, we, we would never do that. Uh, and then we, we build that and the software then learns that, hey, this is now a good program if it's been approved and now you don't have to, to block it in, in the future. The way that it would work for us is let's say that somebody is trying to run a program that's being blocked. It would, they would get a little pop-up, they send us uh, the information. It takes on average 90 to 120 seconds from the time that we get the request to the time that we've approved the software. So, um, and usually it's, it's very rare that we actually have to do this. The only time we have to do it is let's say someone is updating their practice management software and they're the first person of all of our clients to update that software. Well, the, the software here, the, the threat block is gonna say, well, hold on a second. I don't recognize this, this, this new program here. Once we approve it, it goes into that global database. Now, the second person that goes to apply that update for their practice management software isn't gonna get the error because it's already been pre-approved with the first client and it's already part of that global database. So you, know, you basically have a one in 350 chance that you're gonna be the person that has to get that patch applied. Uh, and as I said, it only takes two minutes or so for us to get it approved. So it's not a big deal. What about locking it down? You know, encryption, here in the States, uh, we have, as I said, the breach notification rule with HIPAA. It's your only get out of jail free card that if you are hit with a ransomware virus, if your data is breached, but you can show uh, that you were encrypting the data, you have evidence of that encryption, you don't have to declare the breach. Now, I don't know if that's true for the Privacy Act uh, down there, but uh, here we, we definitely want to be encrypted. Anyway, you want to be encrypted anyway. If someone gets a hold of your data, you don't want them to be able to access it. So you know, encryption is the best way to secure your data. The thing that I find frustrating when dealing with clients is that a lot of times they say, oh, you know, it's just it's too complicated, or I just I don't have the time, or it's too expensive. Pretty much every version of Windows from 2012 onwards has a free encryption program called BitLocker. It's built into your software. Windows 10 has it, Server 2012 and 2016 and 2019 all have it. It's there, it's free. Now, if you don't know what you're doing, yeah, you probably wanna pay an IT company to help you for a few hours of labor to get it set up for you. But it's not like you have to go out and spend thousands of dollars on software that uh, you don't know how to manage. It's already there, it's already built into your operating system. If you are, say, still using Windows 7 or on a Mac or you know, other types of software that, um, that doesn't work with BitLocker, there's free programs. There's VeraCrypt and TrueCrypt. And again, there's, there's lots of options out there. So in my mind, there's really no excuse for not encrypting the data. One of the things we sometimes hear from the practice management software companies is, oh, maybe you shouldn't do that because it could slow down the, the process of opening up files. Um, in Theory that is correct, but in practice, the slowdown is so minimal that you would not really see it. You know, if a chart normally takes 1.3 seconds to open up, it'll take 1.4 seconds if it's encrypted. I mean, it's like I said, it's, it's negligible to the point that you wouldn't even know that, uh, that anything was, was different. What about backing up? Because let's say you've done everything that you can within reason that you've done uh, firewalls and patching, and you've got anti-ransomware doing the application whitelisting, it's still nothing's a hundred percent. Like I said, even though we haven't seen any virus infection since we started doing the application whitelisting, it doesn't mean it's impossible. So the best way to recover is to make sure you've got a good backup. So there are plenty of ways to backup. 
you know, for years, and this is back when, back in the 1990s, people were recommending tape drives. I hope none of you are still using tape. The problem with tape, of course, you know, there's many problems with tape, but one of the biggest is that usually the tape drive is built into the server. So, you know, if the server goes down, your tape drive is down as well. You know, your tape's going to be as good as a paperweight. Um, for a while, people were using rewritable CD-ROM drives, DVD drives. We still have a number of clients using portable external hard drives. The, the beauty of these systems is that they're relatively inexpensive. For 100 bucks or so, you can easily get two to four terabytes of storage, which is more than almost every dental office would, would ever have. They come in all shapes and sizes as well. Um, the software, it's really, again, it's, it's a lot of its personal preference. There are free programs. This is one called Karen's Replicator. Uh, the person who uh, developed the software, Karen Kenworthy, she passed away, I think, about eight, nine years ago. So if you're using it at home, it's a free program. It's okay for offices. I think there's more sophisticated software out there. There's SyncBack Pro. There's all kinds of different other programs out there. Um, you also need to have some place where you can store that data off-site. I happen to be a huge fan of cloud backup. In theory, you could put your data on external hard drives and take it home with you every day. Most of our clients just, they want to get away from the manual labor of handling the backup. You know, why should they have to worry about that when we can take care of that for them? So we could still have a local backup, but for the offsite, we do a, a cloud-based or, or online. It's the easiest and, and most secure way, in my opinion, to handle that. It gets it offsite, it's secure, it's an automated process. You and your staff don't need to do anything. You, you're done at the end of the day, you close up the shop and uh, don't worry about it. It's all being handled for you. Things to look for is make sure there are encryption keys. Whatever company is doing it, they should have multiple servers around the world, you know, basically backups of the backup. Being able to copy open databases, have multiple versions of the data, but also be able to restore single files. And it should be an automated process as well. We have a system that we use for our clients called Data Protect. Um, you ideally want to work with someone that specializes in healthcare and understands the needs of healthcare providers, understands the Privacy Act. There are non-healthcare programs out there like Mosey and Carbonite that are generic type systems that really I don't think are, are ideal. Uh, important to understand that most of you probably have a server that has mirrored hard drives. We call those RAID, and there's different types of RAID. RAID 1, which is the two drives. RAID 5, which is three or more. RAID 10. RAID is not a backup. It's redundancy. It's just multiple hard drives in the server. If your server goes down, if there's a fire, a flood, a theft, having those mirrored hard drives isn't going to do you any good. It's got to be off-site, whether it's a cloud-based, uh, you know, external hard drives that you take home with, whatever. The easiest way in my mind to restore from any type of downtime is to do a virtual server, an emergency server, where you do what's called an image. It's a copy of the entire server, not just the data, the program files, the settings, everything. That way, when it comes time to restore, we fire up that virtual copy of the server and your downtime is measured in minutes. Most other solutions, your downtime is measured in days. And that's obviously not what most dental offices want. They, they want to measure it in, in minutes, which you can do with that virtual copy of the server. You really should have some type of insurance. Again, we have this here in the States. I, I don't know exactly what's available in New Zealand, but uh, certainly, if there is some type of cyber liability breach insurance, usually most office contents, liability policies don't include this. So you would want to talk with your insurance carrier about uh, what the options are. What about a risk assessment? Uh, how do you do that? The, the problem with most risk assessments, or at least learning to do a risk assessment, is that there's really no guidance. Here in the U.S., this is the only thing I've ever seen that is somewhat comprehensive it's the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, it's called the NIST 800-30, which is a guide for conducting risk assessments. It's 95 pages long. Um, again, it would, it would apply mostly to federal institutions here in the US. It wouldn't have any legal basis in New Zealand. But if you're trying to figure out, well, how do I do a good risk assessment? This would be a great document. Uh, it's also a great document if you suffer from insomnia. 
because it is very boring to read. By the time you get to the second page, uh, you're, you're falling asleep. Uh, but I can give you the Reader's Digest version, which is no different than treating the patient. You need to be comprehensive. You need to look at everything. You need to look at things from an IT standpoint, from a uh, physical standpoint, locks on the doors, where the charts kept, uh, all that type of stuff. And administratively, you know, policies and procedures and incident response form and all the things that you need to do to document uh, what you've done and what happens when there's been some type of breach. When we do it for our clients, uh, we like the, system, the software that we use because it gives them a risk score where it will tell them you know, how much at risk they are. We've been doing this for close to 10 years now. We've never seen someone with their initial risk score below about 90. Uh, I don't know exactly what the software algorithms use to determine that score, um, but basically every office when we first start working with them is, is at risk they would be getting some type of risk assessment that says, you know, lets them know specifically where they were at risk. And, uh, you know, it'd be, we, it's pretty in, in depth. When we do it for our clients, it usually takes about five to eight hours or so. We only need you there for 10 minutes or so to get us onto the systems, but the software that we run, the reports, that all takes a few hours for us to, to put together. And then you would also have a management plan. It's not enough to diagnose just like you with the patient. You have to have the treatment plan and it's not enough to just have a treatment plan, you have to actually do the treatment. So same thing here is that you would have basically a really nice spelled out treatment plan of the steps that you need to take to get yourself uh, more secure, uh, more in line with whatever local and, and country guidelines are for security and, and, and privacy. So let's, let's wrap it up. Uh, what are the steps that I think you should be taking right now to get yourself more secure, more compliant with uh, regulations. And this is a recap of what we already talked about. You should do a risk assessment. I recommend doing it annually. We actually have a lot of our clients want us to do it every three to four months, just to sort of keep them on board of, of addressing all the things on there. Normally when we do a risk assessment, the management plan is about nine, 10 pages long, and it can take us anywhere from 10 to 20 hours of time to resolve all the things on there. Some practices want to crank that out in a few days. Others, you know, it takes weeks or months to get to all of it. So oftentimes they want to just do the assessment quarterly, which we're happy to do, just to keep themselves a, a, a pace of where they're at and what they still need to be doing. But it should be a, a somewhat regular. When you do it, whatever system you're using, whoever you're working with, make sure they're also giving you a plan. You shouldn't have to do this on your own. Uh, it should be automatically generated for you that gives you a step-by-step -step guide of the things that you need to do. Now, typically, it's the IT company that's doing it for you. But either way, there should be a plan of what needs to be done and in what order it should be done in. You should have some type of policies and procedure manual. Here in the U.S., it's law. Again, I don't know about New Zealand exactly, but you, know, you should have some type of manual that basically says, you know, if we get hit with a breach, uh, there's, these are the steps that we have to take. You should, in my opinion, have some type of cyber liability slash breach insurance. We do a minimum $250,000 for our clients, uh, just because by the time you get through fines and penalties, and you know, it's considered standard of care to provide some type of credit monitoring for those patients, it can get very pricey. Uh, so you really should have some type of insurance in place. Please encrypt your, your, your computers. It's so easy to do, especially the server. Most of your data is on the server. If you're only gonna encrypt one device, make it the server. But if, you're, if you have any protected health information on the workstations, those really should be encrypted as well. We usually recommend some type of encrypted email system. You don't have to change your email. The better ones don't require that you change your email address or, or anything like that. So. Uh, by all means, uh, and they're, they're not expensive. And, you know, most of the ones that we use are 30, 40, 50 bucks a month for five users. So, you know, 10 bucks a month a user is pretty expensive for an encrypted email system. Absolutely must have some type of backup and disaster recovery system in place. As I said, it's law everywhere, pretty much. Some type of network monitoring, patch management that you're patching the systems, keeping everything current. You should have antivirus software in place and not the free stuff that comes with Windows, but a third-party software. Have ransomware specific protection in, in place as, as well. Application whitelisting. I personally, I think this is like, and it's hard for me to get excited because I've been doing IT for 20 years and I've seen it all. 
But this has really been a game changer that we find it because the, the big issue with a lot of the ransomware out there is that it's what's called a zero day virus, meaning that it's so new, your firewall, your anti ransomware software doesn't recognize it as a virus. The application whitelisting, when we call it threat block, the one that we use, uh, it doesn't make a difference if it's been recognized because if it's not on your approved list, it literally can't run. So I, I highly recommend you get something like this. Uh, you, can, you should be doing some type of training for your staff. Uh, we work with a company called Formed Training that does it. It's more designed for US offices, but it's all, as I said, the concepts are pretty much the same no matter where in the world you are. So you really should make sure your staff are up to date on this as, as well. For any websites that have critical information, you should set up two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication where you know, that code is sent to your cell phone or, or email. So I did want to make a few offers uh, for, I know your time is valuable and wanted to thank you all for being here. So one is that, as I mentioned, is you don't know what you don't know. And one easy way to do that is to do a security audit. We've been doing these for, for quite some time. Uh, we normally charge $97 for it for anyone that is on the webinar or viewing if it goes out to the people afterwards. Uh, I'm waiving that fee towards end of the month. The security audit takes somewhere around 20 to 30 minutes. We hop onto your computers with a secure connection. Uh, we, we gather data. We basically see what you're running for software, you know, the patching, the encryption, the backup. We look at all those things. And then based on all that, I can put together a treatment plan for you of what you should be doing and what's the most critical and what can, you know, can go to phase two or phase three. Uh, but we're willing to waive that fee if, if you are interested. You just have to indicate that you're interested. You don't have to actually pay for it or, or sign up, just a, an email. And I'll give you all my contact information at the end, but just let us know that you're interested and we'll waive the fee for you. You can go to my website, which is thedigitaldentist.com uh, to fill out the information there. I'm also willing through the end of this year do free IT consulting. If you are just want to pick my brain, you want to, you're thinking about expanding your office, you're thinking about replacing your hardware, your practice management software, your image software, anything IT related. You just want some help or some guidance. Uh, again, I'm not going to charge you for my time. Uh, of course, you have to pay the long distance fees, but unless you have a voice over IP phone, but um, still, I, I'm happy to, to waive the fee for that. And again, you can go to the website, which is thedigitaldentist.com. When you go there, you're going to see something that looks exactly like this, where it's got, I set it up for, for people now so that you just get the, uh, fill out your name, the practice name, your email and phone number, and then we will follow up with you to schedule that, that consultation with you. There's lots of ways to get a hold of me. You can go to the website, as I mentioned. Uh, you can email me at drlevine at thedigitaldentist.com. We have a toll-free number, which I'm not 100% sure if it works uh, from abroad. Uh, I can, you know, if anyone's interested, if you email me, I can get you the, the direct number so that you can dial a, a non-toll-free number. I don't know if it works from New Zealand or not. And I'm happy to take any questions that, that may have come up, and I'll certainly uh, put the offers up on here uh, as well. So, uh, Rudy, do we have questions? I can see the, um, the chat, but... Um, hello. Uh, well, thank you so much. That was pretty cool. There's no questions there besides I have some questions for you. Well, I'll just put that on the chat that it was, um, we had a few months, um, a few months back, there was so in New Zealand, we, we don't have states, so we have like a provinces. Yep. And well, not really, we call province, regions. Yeah. And we have different, uh, like the, the, the medical departments on this regions uh, called DHP, which is District Health Board. And one of those was hacked and it was blocked for like a week or two, you know, um, up to three weeks, where there was all the information was completely stopped. And this involved everybody in hospitals and wow. um, on dental, this is some public health. And this is an example of how, how this could stop, right? And, and yep. how, how simple it would have been. Um, but yeah, no, that, that was pretty amazing and good. Th thank you for your offer. Uh, sure. For those ones listening, uh, obviously this is a, it was 97 US dollars 
and what's zero in, <laughs> zero <laughs> zero no matter what dollar you're looking in so and uh and the night is and the 11 in the beginning that means at end of november oh yeah I, I forgot i forgot that anywhere but the u.s you guys put the day before the month i, I apologize i should have known that that's all right yeah no we we kind of used to i guess you know dealing with uh with the states quite a bit but yeah they're fahrenheit and they um in the day, uh, dates you know that's the different ones so yeah, just, you guys also drive on the wrong side of the road i don't know if anyone told you that but i'm just throwing <laughs> it out there so yeah and you're on the wrong side of the car <laughs> <laughs> i figured that out when i came back when i uh, moved here um uh, but yeah so my only question would be uh so how the digital dentists can look after the initial dentist is this a, is this a way to you know work as a way to work in or would you services will be just an assessment and then they can figure it out their own uh, their own help we, everything that i talked about are services that we provide obviously the offices are not under any obligation to work with us um there's, there's a few ways that people tend to work with us um, i say the, the vast majority of our clients want us to handle all their it um, you know, 95% of our clients right now are out of state. I'm in California, but most of my clients are on the East Coast and the Midwest. So the distance is never a, an issue. So we, we can work no problems long distance. We do have the occasional office that says, so as you know, I've got a local IT guy. He's fine. I, I, I like having the security of knowing that he's local and can come over. There's, if there's a hardware problem but he doesn't really understand the cybersecurity stuff. He's not up on, he's never mentioned application whitelisting to me or firewalls, or he's not handling the backup. And in those cases, we can fill in the gap. You know, we learned a long time ago how to play nicely with others. So, uh, you know, if an office wanted to keep their IT, but just have us kind of fill in the areas where their IT may not be up on, on all the current uh, literature, then we'd be happy to, to work with them in that capacity as well. Awesome. Well, it's good to know. Uh, well, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Lauren, and uh, happy Thursday to you. For everybody listening, uh, please keep up, you know, with all the dental chats. We have a, 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 on our Allura website, we have a little click there on um, business building, our learning center, sorry. And then there's a dental chat there, and then all the dental chat, all our guests are there. You can watch that. The CPD point for today is 429611. So I just put it on the chat. Um, and we're going to have this on our website. Please get in touch with uh, Dr. Lavin for any questions to take advantage of this um, great offer. Thank you so much, Lauren. And uh, yeah, we'll hopefully we'll see you in real person. Uh, yeah, well, you guys have to, you have to open your borders. So <laughs> I'm not happy to come anytime. Uh, I think the uh, New Zealand, uh, the, the you know, the tourism, uh, they're not so in, so happy about us coming in quite yet. We will be very happy to have you, I'm sure, you know, hopefully early next year. Yeah, I look forward to it. Okay. Anyway, have a great Thank you for having day. me. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Bye-bye. Nice.